but I'd like to welcome everybody here to our Wednesday SEFS seminar. I'm particularly pleased as a member of the Board of Natural Resources to introduce the chair of the board, Hillary France, who is also the elected commissioner of public lands for the state of Washington. In her role as uh, commissioner of public lands, she protects manages nearly six million acres of public lands in Washington state, from coastal waters and aquatic reserves to working forests and farms to commercial developments and recreation areas. I think I learned that Lake Union is DNR. So, yeah, Lake Union. Yeah. So I go, I kind of Lake Union. You are on our land. So I may come out there and ask you a table. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Uh, any multiple you want is what I'm already doing. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly so uh, Hillary's leading the push to make Washington's lands resilient in the face of climate change, investing in carbon sequestration, and clean energy with wind, solar, and geothermal infrastructure. I've had, as a member of the board, the opportunity to see some of these um, investments up close. And it's really quite impressive, the uh, changes she's making. Uh, one of the big initiatives uh, that she launched was the 20-year Forest Health Strategic Plan which is an agency to develop to, as a plan to make more than a million acres of forest healthier and more resistant to wildfires. Hillary's a third generation farmer, small forest landowner, and has raised three boys. And she cites that as an important learning experience in conflict resolution and dealing with difficult political challenges. She holds a bachelor's degree from Smith College and a Juris Doctor from Northeastern University of Law. Hello, thank you guys. I know my microphone, I'm good without it. I just want to make sure we're good. Okay, can you all hear me? See, that's another why boys were helpful because talk about a farm, you want to get a boy's attention when they're running loose on a farm, all you have to do is go to gutter up like, boys! Uh, kind of mechanics, but I don't mean that any gender specific response. Um, yeah, tell me what to do. I'm not technology. How many uh, were released early from your professor's class because they wanted you to participate? All right, and you didn't even know beer or wine was included. So give those professors a hand for letting you come and have your wine in the same time. Okay. Dr. Brown has been amazing because I... Oh, sorry, I'll just wing it then. You wing over there and I'll work on So Dr. Brown has been amazing because he sits on the Board of Natural Resources, which is uh, one of those boards that most people don't even know about, but they we deal with a lot of conflicting, challenging issues. Like how many remember, I know you're all younger than me except for your professors. I like to think you're at least just about my age. Uh, how many know about the spotted owl issues, right? I grew up in the spotted owl war, right? And we are now entering the next sort of era of war, spotted owl, modern you know, wars. And Dr. Brown has been part of a war making a pretty significant decision. And I've been grateful to have his leadership, his science, and his understanding of some very good questions. Because not all boards are alike. And we, when we have academia on them, I'll say they're always better. So thank you. Um, so. You know what, I'm just going to wing this. Don't worry. Let's it's turn it off. Sure. Let's turn it off. We're going to do it again. Okay. So I, how many of you knew before you came here today was the commissioner, that there was a commissioner of public lands in Washington State? Okay, you are more educated than the majority of all of Washington State residents. Give yourself a hand. No. But yes, you are. How many of you know what the commissioner of public lands does? Besides what your professor told you and gave you free to come today, right? Not much. And I'll... So the reality is, uh, I'm a statewide elected. Um, there are only 16 of us in the country um, that are its own statewide elected, and most people think the governor's my boss, but you are all my boss. You get to tell me whether I'm doing a good job, bad job, and can send your input into me. Um, the reality is most people don't know about the breadth um, of the role. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the breadth of the role, because um, I need all of you guys to be the evangelists that leave here today and say how important this role is and get engaged even more. As a commissioner of public lands, I technically oversee six agencies. First, I oversee 2.6 million acres of aquatic land. 
land. So think the entire coast, the Puget Sound, the rivers, lakes, and streams. We have a proprietary role on, yeah, that looks perfect. <laughs> They'll go, they see, like that. Uh, uh, we have a proprietary role where we have leases with ports, marinas, shellfish, um, single-family dock owners. Um, we generate revenue from those leases that go directly to two things, increasing um, access for the public to our waterways, like Dr. Brown on Lake Union and kayaking, and for salmon habitat restoration and protection. Um, how many people have been on the Ferris wheel here in Seattle? Okay, there are less sea of ours. How many people have been in the Edgewater? Clearly, only one of your professors can afford it. And so, uh, <laughs> we own that. We actually have a hotel management company who run that, right, the hotel. Um, in addition to the salmon, the aquatic lands, we oversee two million acres of forest lands, both west side and the east side of the state. We oversee a million acres of agriculture land. We are actually the largest wheat producer in the state. My goal is to become the largest vineyard and orchard producer in the state. For you beer drinkers, people are pushing me to go that way, as well as pot and hemp. We'll think about that. Let's first tackle orchards and vineyards first is my strategy. Um, I also oversee um, almost 10,000 acres of commercial, residential, industrial land. So Costco, Safeways, Fred Myers. Um, in my role of uplands, all those lands that are not underwater, and I don't mean fiscally underwater, um, <laughs> but lands that uh, are not underwater, we use those, they are largely trust lands. We manage them on behalf of beneficiaries. You are some of those beneficiaries. So we have schools, um, everything from K through 12 to the university, you know, Washington, Washington State University, Don't Boo, and um, also your technical community colleges. We generate about $125 million a year that funds the capital construction of your schools. We also generate about $200 million for counties who are another group of beneficiaries. In all 39 counties we have land, and that land, we, unlike the school land where we got it, statehood as a part of the federal government funding education in each state, the county land was when people couldn't pay their taxes. The land was turned over to this county. The county found during very economically depressed times like the Depression and others that they could not manage those lands. So they turned it over to the state to manage it on behalf of them. Similar to a trust, if your family has a trust, um, we generate about $200 million for counties um, every year. In King County, where we sit, we represent about 0.09% of their operating budget. Just a tiny little blip. They probably don't even see as much until we cut down a tree and they're upset that we have. Um, for many of the other counties, we represent 40% of their operating budget. Huge. Health, housing, human services. If you went free spotted owl days, we represented in some of those communities 80% of their entire operating budget. Now you understand a little bit more about the challenges of why the spotted owl wars, besides the jobs in that community, the, the services that those county and local governments provided. In addition to that, I oversee what, uh, recreation, the largest amount of recreation land in the state. Everything from cross-country trails to ATV, ORV, mountain bikers, horseback riders, hikers, bird watchers, and kayakers. Uh, and I also oversee Washington State Wildfire, the largest wildfire fighting team in the state. And if that wasn't enough, I received Washington State Geology, which many of you may be aware of, but most outside aren't, where we have five live volcanoes, the threat of a big earthquake, tsunamis, and landslides. And I will just say, it is not ever a slow day at the office, whether it's the earth erupting or communities erupting, or politicians, because I'm in legislative session, erupting. There is never a slow day. And I would say right now, we feel very much front and center to a rapidly changing environment and a very fragile environment. And as Dr. Brown pointed, I'd say first I'll start with the wildfire context. 
Last year we had the most amount of wildfires in Washington state history with 1,850 wildfires. To give you a context, if you went back to 1963, how many of you were alive in 1963? I do this just for your professor's humor. Uh, I can't even raise my hand. I love to you just kind of, well, don't tell anybody. Just um, uh, 1963, the Commissioner of Public Land sent out a Christmas card at the end of that year saying you've had a horrific, horrible fire season. 600 acres burned that year. In eight, uh, last year, with 1,850 fires, 440,000 acres burned. It's the highest number of fires, but it was actually a pretty good number of acres burned because in 2015, a million acres burned in Washington State. So, 40% of those fires from 20, uh, 2018 and 2019 were west of the Cascades. It's no longer at central or eastern Washington. Reality, it's now becoming a new part of the western part of our state. And every year, and you guys might remember last year, we had the worst air quality in the world from Spokane to Seattle. And you probably were thinking, those who don't live in eastern Washington, think, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end. The reality is that smoke and that air quality is what eastern Washington's been suffering through since way back to 2013, 2012. Um, and every single year, our state spends on average since 2012, $153 million just responding to fires. This year, you might have thought we didn't have a fire season. Didn't feel like you heard much about it, right? We had 1,165 fires, 135,000 acres burned, 35% of those were west of the Cascades, and it cost the state $80 million to respond. Why we're seeing more significant catastrophic fires is a forest health. For all you foresters in the room, you know way more than I do. So um, please bear with my ignorance. Um, but we have a forest health crisis in Washington State. And we have 2.7 million acres alone in central and eastern Washington that are dying or in the process of dying. You might have seen it with your own eyes, but we're seeing the Evergreen State turn brown while we live here. And we believe, I believe, in coming into this position that we spend too much time in government reacting to a crisis, waiting for a crisis to happen before we focus on it, whether it's mental health, addiction, transportation, housing. Um, the same place true when it comes to wildfire and forest health. So we developed in 2017 a 20-year forest health plan for Central and Eastern Washington that has us treating 1.25 million acres of forest over the next 20 years. Uh, it's about 70,000 acres a year. To give you a sense of the scale that we're going at, the pace and scale, between 2005 to 2012, our agency treated 35,000 acres in seven years. The first year after doing that plan, we treated 30,000 acres in 2018. This year, we'll do 50,000 acres, and the goal is to quickly move to 70,000 acres and more. We're now in the process of developing the forest plan, and I hope for all of you, your professors and students, to get engaged as we develop now the West Side Forest Health Plan as we're seeing the dying off of forest in many parts of our state that have traditionally been very wet and cold. Um, and our goal will be that we will truly change the trajectory and the pace and scale of these catastrophic fires that we certainly are not missing in California and certainly right now not missing in the context of Australia. We also developed a 10-year wildfire plan that brought local, state, and federal agencies together to be able to fight our fires better with resources. We currently at the state of Washington have truly underinvested in wildfire fighting. Um, when I got into office, we had eight helicopters as our entire wildfire air fleet. Every one of them fought in the Vietnam War and have the bullet holes to prove it. How many of you guys are driving the car from the Vietnam War? <laughs> Nobody. I found two Washingtonians. They do believe it's probably a TR3 sports car of some kind that when they raise their hand, reality is we're putting firefighters in danger, up in the air, in, out. They're great machines my mechanics put together, but the fact is we have too limited resources and not enough high quality resources. And we're putting firefighters, many of them younger than those in this room, on the line fighting these fires. Our plan, our goal is to be able to actually build a wildfire force that is able to match the kind of fires we have so they can get on the ground quickly and reduce the damage. 
Paradise, California, y'all remember those images? Many of you might think, well, it's snowing outside, it's cold, it's wet in many parts of the year. That could not happen here in Washington State. The reality is a national study has now identified at least three communities in Washington State that are in more dangerous risk than Paradise, California was. Roslyn community in Okanagan and a community in Yakima County. And we know many more are very close as well. So we have the same risks here, and it's my responsibility to make sure those risks and those disasters don't happen. In addition to the wildfire forest health, we are also looking at our forests in the context of carbon sequestration opportunities. Many of the work that you, some of you are doing is helping us, and I appreciate the partnership with UDEV on this. Our goal is we've just completed inventory of all of Washington State's forests, not just the public lands, but the private lands, so that we can start to enter into markets, not in the full life cycle of the tree, from where it grows on the ground to when it becomes a part of a building like the one we're in. It's part of the cutting work edge that, um, cutting edge work that we're That's doing. That I didn't actually, I had two sips of wine. They all looked at me a little worried that my staff was including whether I could handle it. So, um, uh, in the carbon sequestration, I think this is one of the opportunities for our agency because of our science arm, because of our partnership with UW, of being able to leverage that work and my hope is that we're going to actually be able to use that as we turn to our rural communities and many of them who have had generational poverty um, for a long, long time and not a chance of opportunity where they can't look to the next generation and say it's going to get better here. That we look at the context of carbon markets and the importance of our natural resource, economy and environment to start to change the trajectory of not valuing our natural resource lands, not valuing our rural communities who manage those, and not valuing the carbon opportunity as climate change becomes much more visual and present for us. So in addition to that, um, SAM is one of my other major, major focuses. Um, many of you probably witnessed the orca, as we saw last year, who carried their dead baby for her dead baby for weeks on end, and an entire nation and world were moved. And the reality is we work very often in an species that we see are going on path of extinction and we get little blips of attention for them and then it goes away before some other issue comes up or some other crisis. Um, the reality is we have spent in my career 20 plus years focused on salmon recovery. Some people in this room have spent even more and we haven't really turned the tide or made much positive success. We spend enormous amount of money that we raise in the process of our leases to salmon recovery. We've removed 70 Boeing 747s worth of toxic material from our Puget Sound alone over the last 10 years, my agency. Um, we have done an enormous amount of acres of protection and restoration in salmon habitat. Some of you have probably worked on that. But we continue to not see the kinds of change that we need. Coming this spring, uh, we will be launching a whole new effort, a whole new salmon strategy that will be in addition to the work we're already doing with the goal of bringing all of our jurisdictional authority into three key watersheds and then testing and proving them. Dr. Brown and some of your colleagues were, and I were talking about how we marry up the University of Washington with this. The idea is trees to seas. How do we truly look at every single challenge in a watershed from the headlands of the federal lands and state lands all the way down to the water, to the urban environment because we oversee the urban forestry program. And we know stormwater is a big significant pattern, uh, factor of why we're seeing um, impacts to Puget Sound and to salmon habitat to the aquatic lands. In that, our goal will also be to be bringing the private sector in that community in to bring their own resources and adopt that watershed with us. And if we can bring a significant amount of attention and focus and energy and money to three watersheds to prove that we can change the trajectory of salmon, I believe we can change the value and influence we've been placing and spreading out oftentimes too thin to actually get impact change. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity that I'm excited about making it. The three rivers we're allowing, the three system watersheds we're looking at right from the get-go is going to be the Snohomish River, it'll be the Piala, and it will be the Nisqually with Nooksack and Cowlitz um, soon behind because Chinook are not so far gone there. They're on a path that could either get proof or get worse. They're key indicator species, obviously critical for Orca and for others. Um, in addition to that, um, we have a significant amount of land in that area, not only in the urban forest, urban environment, but both.
vegetables, so in the aquatic and in the ag and forest side and the federal lands. There's a significant play for them, and we now have the ability to do projects on federal lands so we can break down that jurisdictional barrier um, and not have to wait for them, but instead leverage our resources and their resources to get there faster. A third big piece is energy. Um, we currently um, have been focusing an enormous amount of effort in the context with the clean energy bill passing. Are you doing this for me? Yes, I am. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. David goes, oh, you should go back to, I have to go back to, oh, no, actually, go to energy and I'll do this again. <laughs> this is why, see, this is me, two, two sips, not two glasses of wine, and no PowerPoint. So, we have completed 21 wind leases to date on our lands. We just finished the two uh, largest solar farm leases in the state of Washington. Our goal, um, we have about 35 solar farm leases in the pipeline currently. We are in the process of finishing mapping all of the geothermal possibility of the entire state of Washington's landscape. And, the, and we are now looking at pump storage biomass as opportunities. When we start to look at our lands and utilize them for renewable energy opportunities, we not only are moving to more cleaner, sustainable energy and meeting the larger demands of the population here in a cleaner way, but we're also able to generate oftentimes more significant revenue for our schools and our counties. So historically on this land, we might have generated zero to $1.43 an acre um, for grazing. And with wind or solar, we moved to about $800 to $1,400 an acre. In some cases, it's a 98,000 percent increase in revenue. Um, we are now looking at biomass opportunities, especially because of the context of our forest health treatments. As we do those 70,000 acres, um, we are able sometimes to make value off of that by taking the smaller diameter and the disease trees and turning into that cross laminate timber product which is now we have the two largest cross laminate timber manufacturing facilities in the united states built in eastern washington alone um, which not only is creating over 150 jobs uh, just this year but is also able to now build more sustainable and sometimes affordable building within our urban areas like affordable housing needs in Seattle, but also University of Washington Tacoma's campus is now looking to create um, a leadership role in the context of cross and timber within the education environment in an urban neighborhood type approach. Um, on the energy side, on biomass, we are find that while we might be able to make revenue off that small diameter in the disease trees, if we have a mill nearby to take it, we are still left with oftentimes a quarter acre size, five story high slash piles that we right now burn ourselves, which emits into the atmosphere and it costs us not only environmentally but economically. And ideally, if we could turn that into a product like a pellets, we might be able to not only make money but also meet the clean energy um, goals that we have set within our state's policy. Lastly, before I go to questions, right? We're going to do that. Lastly, we are in big context as climate, as I mentioned, that we feel very much on the front lines of this. We feel like we have a responsibility to not only manage these lands that we have six million acres, not only for present generations, but we have a responsibility not only fiduciary, but also morally, to manage them for the next generation and many generations after. With the rapid change in climate that we're seeing in the context of our own lands, everything from wildfire and dying forests to the context of drought to even dust storms that we're seeing on some of our agricultural land and parts to the spread of invasive weeds, um, we believe we have responsibility. We have completed five years of study on the impacts climate change is having today and likely to have in the future on our lands management from our aquatic lands to our uplands everything from sea level rise and ocean acidification. We're the largest gooey duck producer in Washington state, um, that before the China tariffs, we were making almost $30 million a year on, because it's China's number one after Bichan. Gotta love them. 
And uh, the reality is that uh, ocean acidification is having a huge impact on not only our ability to raise it, but also on the larger economy for the state and the funding that we generate for it that goes to salmon habitat restoration to the context of our timber <coughs> and our agricultural plants. We completed that uh, later this month, actually early February, we will be announcing the first ever Washington State Climate Resilience Plan that is truly how do we set up not only our six million acres of land that we manage, but how do we set the state up to truly be recognizing the impact climate change are having now and in the future, and how do we start making the investments today to be more resilient in the face of it. Um, part of our goal there isn't to just look at our agency and what our agency can do, to, but to give the tools to the communities who are on the front lines of this, um, the kinds of needs they need to be making in investments. And we are now starting to have community conversations and um, communities across the state, many of them who may not recognize climate change is real or deny it or not be willing to talk about it but know something's wrong to start to actually be working with them to make the critical investments they need, whether it's the context of water storage, forest health, agriculture using biochar or other types of materials to be able to get higher yields in a more sustainable way. Um, and, you know, I'd say before we go to questions, the biggest thing, um, I had a great opportunity to talk to a number of students and a number of professors here today, and it was an honor. To be honest, thank you for bringing me out of Olympia, especially during the legislative session. It's colder and icier there than here. Thank you for the warm welcome, even though you guys have more snow here. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to actually be able to hear about the unbelievable cutting science and innovation that's happening. Um, oftentimes in our work, um, you get sort of very much focused on your day to day, and it's very hard to be brought up above it. I know that's true for many of my team members who. Um, oftentimes feel very, very overwhelmed by the amount of work, the amount of responsibility, and the limited resources to do it. Um, I am very much excited when I go into environments like this to have the innovation and curiosity and the energy because it fills me up and helps me go back to my job the next day. It also reminds me of why I'm here and the importance. And I'll just say, I have a nameplate when I got into office because we all have a very finite amount of time we're lucky to be here, we're lucky to have every hour of time we have here. And oftentimes we take it for granted. Or we think it's just another day or it's just another year. And the older we get, the more we realize it's not just necessarily another year. Um, and we only have so much. And the reality is we oftentimes waste our time and we waste our ability to create change, not thinking that any one of us can make a significant difference. When the reality is every one of us can make a massive difference whether it's right within your school community, your neighborhood, or the larger state. And you as scientists, you as economists, you as researchers, you as academia and innovation have the most amount of ability to change because you have the knowledge and the curiosity and the willingness and the desire and the commitment to natural resources, which right now is so hard to get people coming into. My nameplate on my desk remind me every single day says, do epic shit. <laughs> Pretty simple, three words, do epic shit. Um, why? Because oftentimes when we have a big decision in front of us or a small decision in front of us, it's easier for people like me to pass it off and not get it done and not recognize the value of not making decisions or not recognize the value of curiosity and investigation and research and having your decision be based on science and trying to move a populace to or the population to that direction because it's hard. And the fact is right now more than ever we all need to do an epic shit. Because we've got epic challenges, but we've got epic opportunities for the kinds of transformation that frankly when I was some of your ages, I thought I could make and would easily be making like first time the salmon were listed in a major metropolitan area right out of my getting out of law school. I thought the world is fine when they get the way gut and salmon are getting out. That was 20 some years ago and not much has changed uh, except for I have more college tuitions to pay for because my kids are all taller than headed off or in your own. So um, I urge you guys every single day when you're 
pouring in your books and your teachers are asking for more and you're one. Do epic shit. We need you guys more than ever. We need you guys inspiring people older than you and younger than you to do that kind of epic shit and to care about our natural resources and our environment, but to care about the communities who are on the front line who frankly don't have enough people. Questions. Questions, comments, criticisms. Go for it. Can you go over some of the ways that students and faculty would be involved in the Oh my gosh, I know, and I feel this is where I wish I had my entire team of 1,500 people coming for me. I know how. We, you know, um, so first, I will just say, students, we have every March opens up an internship, so I'll just start there. It's paid internships, and I wish we had more, like a thousand of them, but first, you should make sure you check in. Um, with my office in March for internship opportunities. I would also say that um, we are always looking for, and part of why this day happened was that we see each other once a month, and I see the Dean of Agriculture at Wazoo once a month, and we talk about, wow, how do we get this intersection? And some of my team are already making those intersections. Because how many people are already working on a Department of Natural Resource type you know, project that's connected to our school, I mean, our agency already? Right? So we have maybe 10, 12, right? Um, we have these kind of interactions, and I think our responsibility now is to say, how do we now bring our, the other people in my agency, and what are the things that are needing answered besides me? Because I'm not as smart as most of the people in my agency. What are the things, questions we're needing answered? What are the areas in the farms? What are the areas in agriculture? What are the areas in forestry? What are the areas in geology? What are the areas? And then making that connection and, and with a lead from each one of those programs, with a lead in the university, that we can then start to drive more of that connection with that work. Um, we were just talking right before this about the salmon strategy, for example, and I didn't even know about the cooperative. I mean, I've been in this role for years, I had no idea that we clearly are getting value of it, right? But I did not know about the cooperative, the research, and the value we get from the university. And we're now talking about the salmon strategy and saying, well, how about we bring my team and connect to say, how do we start creating, doing research before we even launch that project so we can do that over time and capture it? So I think what we need to do is have that connection with people within each one of our programs, with each one of the schools. And then we do a follow up several times each year, like, well, what did we learn? And then also, how do we go to the legislature and get more money for both? Getting it up here. Yes, back here. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if you talked a lot about the forest fires. And uh, you know a lot of those forest fires start in federal forests. Um, uh, a lot of those forest fires start uh, in federal forests and, and trouble. Uh, with good neighbor authority, do you think uh, you have enough uh, tools and resources and permission to manage some of those fires from coming in? Getting private land or uh, our state lands? Yeah, I'm so Good Neighbor Authority. Good Neighbor Authority is a new authority that I signed in March of 2017 that enables us to do um, actually eight different types of projects from forest health to salmon restoration to recreation on to road engineering and maintenance on federal lands because we know federal lands have been largely very much underfunded. We believe we can do it more efficiently and effectively because we already have boots on the ground. Um, the, I believe that it is going to grow and expansion. When I came into this position in 2017, um, I had one person entire 1,500 people to do forest health. We are growing that, and the goal is, is that we will be able, with more people, we can go out and do more of those forest projects. We've already done over 15 just in two years on, um, that are set up and getting ready to go or already completed um, on the, the federal lands. Um, right now, I'm trying to actually move to a more sort of um, standard approach to, here's a context. In the central part of Washington, we have some of our most significant risk for fire. We have our, some of our most significant forest health crisis. 
We have no mill infrastructure, so it's very hard to make any sort of revenue off it, so it demands a lot of revenue in without much return other than in the forest ecology side. We are looking at um, trying to secure a commitment from state and federal agencies as to X number of acres in that region over X period of time, um, and then working to get a commitment from a mill um, small, big, right, into it based on that commitment. That will then help streamline and get more efficient and more, um, I would say, scale and acceleration of that good neighbor authority work. Okay. Yes, you and then her. So uh, one of the things that you you talked a lot about and that you've done a lot of work on is connecting to rural communities and recognizing the challenges the rural communities face particularly those that are natural resource dependent, they're seeing changes in regulatory environment, they're seeing changes in the economic environment, they're seeing changes in uh, climate, all these things challenging them, and uh, jobs going away, and, and uh, part of the strategy you're talking about is both addressing the natural resource challenges but also addressing the community challenges. What are those key strategies for sustainable rural communities where you've had a traditional dependence on natural resources that is, if not going away, certainly changing in significant ways. So this is a this is an area. Um, my just sorry, a bit of background. My grandparents came from South Dakota, Kansas County in 1938. Uh, my grandfather was one of 12 came to come complete poverty. He was the first though to go to college against his father's will because he left the farm to go to college and. Um, and that farm uh, literally went under with the uh, black blizzards of the Great Depression in South Dakota, right? So this is in my blood, right? And I was raised on those stories and working hard and the land and the value of land returns for you, not just physically, um, but emotionally. Um, and I would say one of the things that has been, uh, the, the thing that has moved me the most in this job is going into these communities and seeing the palpable um, reality of these communities. And I urge anybody who doesn't necessarily have a sense of this, anybody in natural resources needs to really, truly understand the impacts that are happening in our rural communities. You really, truly do, because they are on the front lines. New York Times just did an article, there's a thousand of them, but this one was another movie one that really tells it from the side of one family. It's the Knapp family. It just happened in the last two weeks. I urge you to read it so you really understand in a real palpable way how a family who went into the rural community because they could not to be living on the land the same way I raised my kids on the farm, but I had a lot more security than they did. Um, and how it has devastated multiple generations of that family in multiple different ways. And if we're going to change the tide of this context of the environment versus the economy, which I believe they don't work against each other. But we have this cultural sort of understanding that we do. And much of the policies that we make, we, we pit them against each other. All the parties and the politicians, we all do that, rather than coming at it from a context of how can they work together. When I came into this position, I, I came off the 2016 election where this was very much a part of not only our nation's uh, conversation, but it was our state's conversation as well. Uh, of trying to find a way how we can really dive into it, knowing we can't solve it overnight because it's multiple generations in the making of a problem. Um, and I launched a rural economic development initiative in my agency. And my agency, my people have been there many, like 25, 30 years, says, we don't do economic development. I said, what are you doing? And I said, we generate $325 million a year. <laughs> We're the largest wheat producer, we're one of the largest timber growers. We are economic development. We're not the only economic development. But we could do more if we were more intentional about it, right? If we actually went into communities and said, we don't believe we have all the answers. We believe we can be part of the solution. Help us understand your biggest challenges. Help us understand your biggest opportunities. What we bring to this is land. We bring science and economists and research. We also bring access. Many of these communities do not have the capacity or the, the either the money, the time, the intellectual knowledge, information, or the access to that. 
And they are asking for people to show up, not to tell them what to do, but to please be there to help be part of figuring out the solution. And that's what we did. Um, and we, it is not easy. We have a long way to go. We're only two years in on this work. Um, I will tell you, just as you were asking this question, and then I'm going to get to hers, I think, you said, how do we do this? I don't have an answer. I'm figuring it out by walking in and asking, how can I help this community? Learning and walking the landscape and listening, figuring out what hasn't been working, what could still be working, but how so how the economy and the world is changing and how do they catch up to it, and what is their role in it? I think one exciting thing we could do, which would be very interesting, you guys probably know what IV team, right? These teams that go in and try to assess the situation, right? It would be fascinating since University of Washington probably has the, I know you're top 10 in the world, uh, probably the finest, best economists in the world, <laughs> probably has some of the finest, best scientists in the world, and natural resource scientists, probably has some of the most amazing sort of social service understanding. University of Washington can partner with us on an IV team type of thing that says, how do you join with us going into a community? Mm -hmm. And saying, we bring people with expertise or the intellectual cost, curiosity and understanding to want to dive into what are those science and environmental challenges you're facing? What are the economic challenges you're facing? What are the social challenges you're facing? And then how do we collectively together go and work to try to create a change and get resources for them? Just an idea, it's probably a really bad idea, a dumb idea, but I think it could be interesting. Yes, um, I truly was going to ask a, a very similar question about oh, rural development, okay. but um, I guess I would also wonder, um, given that your work is clearly very, like affects almost every Washingtonian probably, but is like, not often you know yeah. known yeah. if you could put out like a message that has to do with like the environment and like how we can move forward as Washington to like students or um, kids or just Washingtonians in general like what would you want them to know about about Washington about moving forward together I'm sure I understand the question um, like if if people were gonna know something what's the problem about, you're trying to solve? Um, like this is a, like a very community-based issue, especially like with rural development and stuff. But it's often so like partisan. Mm -hmm. And like, how would you? I don't know. Your 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 team seems to be working, probably having to 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 work around that partisan issue or try to just avoid that conversation and like not let it get polarizing. And because it's like an environmental issue, but it's it's you that making it like polarizing would be completely ineffective, or like it would just like uh, make people defensive, probably. Or like you said, like you, you said about um, you're working with communities who might be denying climate change or something like that. But that's not the issue. The issue is like their son doesn't have a job or something. Um, so I was I, I was going to ask about like how you kind of talk to or like message to like these communities about what you're doing and, and how you're trying to help without making them defensive or making it political? Great question. Um, so I'm going to give you two contexts. One is the first thing you need to do is you got to show up, right? You can't make a law and create a law and just say, hey, I issued a law and never show up in that community. Um, because then you're very much doing something to them without one, understanding the community, the lay of the land, the landscape, right? Like, I'm sure you guys have never, all the scientists in the room, we never did research and issued a paper or scientific research without actually getting on the land that you were researching, right? You wouldn't have done that, right? And so it's the same thing, right? But we, oftentimes, decisions are being made constantly without really actually going into that community and understanding. And I'll give you a perfect example of like showing up. So, um, Forest Health, we had our, one of our first, we had Forest Health, right? You're thinking, this is a no-brainer. The forests are burning. We need to go in there, remove the disease and the trees. We need to get some of the smaller diameter. We need to get back to a forest ecology that is healthy and resilient to fire like it used to be. Everybody wants this. Who wants those forests to fly, like, blow up in flames? The reality is, 
Not everybody wants you to come in and touch that forest, even if it's dying and disease and it could go up in flames. And we were going through a process of doing a forest health project in the Meta. You know, our Meta is Okanagan County, right? Mazama, Winthrop, right? By the way, they are the most engaged public in the entire state of Washington. You might think Seattle is with all the Seattle City Council stuff going, it is that. And we had, we had done a few forest health projects after rolling out the forest health plan. Um, and then my team comes and goes, you know, we've done one or two, right? And they go, we've got a, all of a sudden my email blows up. This is usually what happens. And my phone and my email blows up. And they're like, you're trying to kill a forest. I'm like, okay, where is this? What is happening, right? And I go to my team and they're like, we have a forest health project right smack dab in Winthrop, right? behind Sun Mountain Lodge, where all the brides get married and want the trees behind them, and I'm now ruining every wedding and marriage in Washington State, and I'm gonna, it's going to be denuded. There's not gonna be a tree anywhere, right? I mean, the world is coming to an end, right? And my people go, we just need to do this. You said you believed in forest health. Why are you not doing this? And I said, hold on, sometimes you have to go slow to go fast, right? So if I had gone down there and said, you know, we're doing the right thing, we told you what we're going to do this, and this is the right thing to do, and you all don't know enough, and we know a lot, I will tell you I'd be in a lawsuit, and now my forest health plan of 20 years would have lost the trust and confidence of the people, right, that I, and the legislature, that I also need, right? Um, and so what we did is we did a town hall. And my people who are really nervous about town halls, right? These are foresters. How many of you guys like to get up in front of people and go, have them all go, yours, rotten, you're awful. What are you thinking? I know that better than you. How many of you like to do that? Most foresters like to go out in the woods and say, do not bother me. Do not talk with me. I got into forestry to get in the woods and be left alone. And I said, no, we're going to have a town hall meeting. They're like, you're not going to come back alive. And I go, no, I, I mean, be fine, right? Rock them in. And I had them do the PowerPoint on wildfire protection and what we're doing to be more prepared for fires and what our forest health plan is, right? And then I did a town hall meeting. And we then did a tour of that landscape. And everybody said, Hillary, if you're going to do this for every forest health project, we're never going to do I go, I don't need to do this for every forest health project. Not every community is so invested. Not every community is so afraid. And some of these forests are so removed from community, right? They now are all in on board. Every environmental organization, every community, and that was just going slow to go fast, and that's how we brought them along. Let me do one final thing on climate change. So we know there's a debate, does climate change exist or doesn't exist? How many believe it exists? Just so I know what audience is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so we know there's a debate, okay? And a lot of people, like in my position, spend an enormous amount of time debating. And I will tell you, I will be doing nothing for climate change for my children and being able to make a more resilient state and help us address this climate change if I spend all my time doing it, right? The only way we're going to create change, right, is to actually go into those communities who are on the front line of climate change right now, whether it's the fires and the forest health, the drought, the loss production on their agriculture, right, or the smoke in the skies that's ruining their wreck economy, right? And so what I have all, we've already started doing is we went into one of the most conservative communities that you would never say climate change, right, in that community. Um, and we invited all the leaders from that community, from the public utility to the county commissioners, the mayors, the council members, the school board, the parks commission, the sheriff, the fire chiefs, and we invited them to come have a conversation about what we're seeing on a change in climate. The room was full. Everyone came. I didn't tell them I was going to cut a budget. I don't have any authority over them. Just invited. They all came. We spoke for about, a, we presented our science. We talked about what we're seeing. We talked about our climate resilience plan, why we believe we need to be proactive, because we're all three behind. And every one of them said, we know there is a change. We are already seeing it. We're already afraid of it. Will you work with us? Will you help us? What are some of the projects we can start? And too often what happens in the climate change debate is the people who are most at risk or already feeling 
do not feel that anything's going to change positively for them. And most of the people who are talking about climate change won't even go into their communities, sit down and have coffee at their ta coffee table, and ask them, what are they most afraid of? Separate from climate, right? And oftentimes, those things will come in. They're afraid of wildfire. They're afraid of the dying force. They're afraid of the drought. They're afraid of the smoke that fills the air. They're and now we are, they come to my office in Olympia, and we're already talking about real projects that we can get on the ground. And that's how we start to truly change, not only the hearts and minds, but change the direction of where we're going on climate. It takes a lot more work. It takes a lot more time. But in the end, it's way more effective. In the back. Yes. So I'm wondering if there is a resources bay of the capital. You were mentioning the idea, of course, of us adopting legislature, but I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us to go to the capital and engage with the legislature and help communicate some of the important messages that we need to get so I love this because we have, oh my gosh, you guys, we have lobby day and everything. By the way, it, how many people eat beef? I, I've offended anybody by that word alone. Just tell me. How many people eat beef? They're afraid to say it. But the reality is, the beef day is the best. When the cattlemen come, I mean, the line of legislators <laughs> that line up to get beef fed cattle is like the, they get the most amount of attention is cattle lobby day, lobby day, because they, they feed everybody. We have environmental lobby day, we have mental health lobby day, we have addiction lobby day, we have social health, we have university lobby day out of that, right? Education lobby day, I'm sure. Um, I don't think we have natural resource lobby day. And let me tell you why that might be different from environment. To be frank, and we have a lot of environmental organizations in the state, and they're all amazing, and I've been on many of their boards, and I've been in these of them. I don't feel that the natural resources issue, right, is raised up at the level because if it's just in the environment, we've missed a significant part of the story, the context, and the value. And ideally, we it, a natural resource day not only would it get bring hopefully diverse stakeholders together who may not actually talk well with each other now, but focus on something they can get behind. I mean, that's not going to be easy, but but also it's that context. And we were talking earlier in some of the meetings I had today about. Most of our asks around natural resources, which is, whether it's the natural resource conservation areas, which are those, and the natural resource heritage areas, which are sort of those most precious spots and plants and wildlife and areas of Washington State that are sacred and not found anywhere else, to the context of landscapes that we are trying to preserve and conserve, we can't get the attention from the legislature really to fund this. It, it is so hard. It, uh, and I don't know what that looks like. I'm going to go back to my team and think about it. Another is we have what's called um, caucuses, which are legislator groups. Like, so there's a wildfire caucus, and we have uh, someone's working on a salmon caucus, right? I, we, I don't think we have a natural resources caucus, which would be, we do. You knew I was going to say something eventually. Oh, you want to come join me again? No, no, that's fine. You're doing a good job. So tomorrow, I don't know if there's any folks here in the SAF, but tomorrow is the SAF Legislative Day in Olympia at the Children's Museum. Awesome. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's the SAF um, Legislative Day. And here's the context. In a way, what might be interesting, Mike, so how many people are going to be coming? Oh, gosh. Last Usually, year, yeah. there must have been 200 people there. 200 people. <laughs> Small force landowners are very well represented yes. there. Here's the challenge. I've been begging seven million a year just to, for small force landowners and we can't get them. Well, we finally got them. So yeah. We need one more million, I know, to make it. <laughs> um, but the reality is all the natural resources are also broken out. Cattlemen are a natural resource, yeah. right? We break all of them out. What if we all came as one big army, yeah. right? We, you know, we, it would be interesting to your point if we group them more in one big legislative day to show how big from the tribes and fisheries to the forestry to the agriculture. Um, something to think about. Yeah. Okay, you, sir, and then over here. You sent me a I did that. I did that too. The comment I mentioned on the firefighting for the helicopter, the old helicopters, is that just an issue of the legislature doesn't want to let you buy these expensive helicopters? Are there other approaches, uh, at least purchase? Uh, you know, West Coast Consortium. 
How do you solve that other than I mean, just by more freedom? Is that a legislative resource problem? So overarchingly, it is a re it is. Uh, so here's the deal. Um, the way government works at the state level and even the federal level is they don't turn into actually giving significant funding to solve, right, until it's a crisis. So education, McCleary, they had to be sued. Now we're in a crisis, now we gotta do something. Mental health, we're now in a crisis. We now have a homeless crisis. I mean, we've all known we've had a homeless crisis for 10 plus years, right, but it's now a crisis. Now we have to do something. That's why it's so interesting how I'm trying to push this proactive investment Right? We already have a welfare crisis, but we know that crisis is going to get way worse because we can see our neighboring states and even our neighboring countries. Right? So why we have a fleet as old as we do is because we haven't had the investment. So what we get is army surplus. So the Vietnam War, we get them free from the army surplus. The one, I just got a million dollars to put a new helicopter, not a new, an old helicopter together to make it roughly new. That um, helicopter, again, Vietnam War, uh, we got in 2011, and it's been sitting in a hangar waiting for us to get a million dollars to put it together. Um, my new aircraft that I'm also gonna get is an old one that is just not as old as Vietnam era um, that we just are just purchased actually uh, this week out of Virginia. Um, so we get very little dollars. Um, this last year, 50 million is the most our state has ever given for wildfire and forest health, about 17 million for forest health, but the um, rest was for wildfire. And before that, at best, we got maybe 25 million, and before that, zero. So when I came in 2017, the governor's budget for wildfire after the 2014 through 2016, zero dollars. Wildfire and forest health. Same thing the following year. So if they, our dedicated revenue now, so if you guys, you know, I'm not going to pitch you, I'm just going to tell you that, you can decide if you care about it. Um, we believe if we're going to change the trajectory of wildfire and forest health in Washington State, we must be proactive in investing in our fund. To do that, we built the forest health plan. Most state agencies don't even build a plan. I at least built a plan and then asked for the money to, to put the plan into effect. A wildfire, 10 year wildfire strategic plan, and a 20 year forest health plan for Central Michigan. And it says here's what we need to do to change the trajectory, and here's the investments needed, and here's the annual to get there. Um, now, for those plans not to just be plans on the shelf, but to be truly actualized, we need money and investment. If every year I'm begging for money, I'm going to fall short. So the reason I got money in 2019 is because 2018, Seattle finally felt the pain of fire. And all of a sudden, it was on again. Hillary, what's going on? The world's coming to an end. I can't breathe. Soccer's been counseled for my kids. Right? I was like, Okay, I've been feeling this for five years, right? You're just now paying. And they're like, so this year, they're like, wow, Hillary, you probably spent nothing on wildfire. There's no fires. Did you guys see any fires? Uh, Blue skies, your summer's bad. Some people go, wow, Hillary, you're going to go really well. <laughs> the problem is I'm like, oh, I'm more thankful for the weather. We do have great fire fire. But the fact is, is they now think I didn't spend any money on fire at all because they didn't recognize the 1,135 fires that we were fighting, and it did cost $80 million. And so they're thinking they can move on to other subjects. But we know the forests are dying, and they're only going to continue to die without doing the forest work we need. And wildfires will still be here. They will be at an increasing scale based on the forest health condition, especially now what we're seeing in western Washington, unless we have the resources to get on them quickly and put them out. And so it's about raising the flag and getting legislators and leaders to not be more proactive. So, um, you, I imagine one challenge of your job is dealing with the conflict between federal policy and state policy. And um, I'm just curious, you talked about orcas and salmon, and I was wondering your thoughts about um, Snake River Dam and opening up salmon habitat for um, orcas and for salmon. Also, um, related to that, Camper Challenge, what are we going to do with the nuclear waste piece of the economy? So here's what I like, here's what usually happens to say, I get this question, and I'm like, so only I'm like, you know what, that's not my jurisdiction on authority, Snake River Dams or Camper, so I usually go, can I duck and cover, right? Because I don't actually do it. happens that it's going to be a challenge. 
No, I, I, but I'm just saying, right? But I, I don't have jurisdictional authority. I'm just saying, right? You know, so, so sometimes a lot of the leaders like to stay out of what is their jurisdiction and not get involved. So, so I'll be frank right from the I don't know those two issues, especially Hanford, as well as I know all the other issues I've talked about today, because that's in my, my jurisdiction. I'm not afraid, right? On Snake River dams, um, I know there's an enormous amount of analysis. I know the government of Idaho has come back, come back and said, which I think is phenomenal, because we all know Idaho politics. It said they need to be taken down, right? Um, I know that there is a significant split in this state between the things that come down and, hey, what's the impact? I look at it from a context that I bet it will have huge, huge value in the sand, right? Uh, and, and I look at it from the context of saying, we need to start thinking about how we would take those down, and what is the time, what are the impacts, right, and how would we address those impacts? So for example, the aquatic lands on that river, right, I manage a lot, right? The amount, and I've seen Elba River with my own eyes when they took that down, and now I have 80 acres of unbelievable habitat, um, and because of the sediment, and the, we have to be thinking about what is all the sediment impacts, and before we take it down, how do we have those community conversations about not only the transportation costs and economic impacts, but also, because my people are like, has anybody looked at the sedimentation and how it's going to wipe out all the infrastructure that are on our lands that we've leased, and how do we address that, right? And I think that's the conversation I, you know, we need to be having, because it will start to move from the no, yes, no, yes, to, hey, we hear your concerns and it's how about we talk about how we would address this, right? And when we can start having those conversations, we will move past a no yes type of discussion. Um, not a perfect example. On Hanford, I, I don't have a mess. And, and, but I will tell you, we will be significantly impacted because um, a majority of our vineyards and orchards are right in that area. And for those who have done that it's not working on that, figuring out what I can do in this role or any other role I have. Okay, work. Yes, sir, and then I'll go with you. Are you concerned that Washington County and other trustees will take action similar to what's happened in Oregon with the billion dollar judgment <laughs> against the state? And there we go. if you are concerned about that, I, I don't quite understand. Well, I don't understand I just what, the, what the Oregon County is going to do. Well, I don't we understand. we got a lot of there. money coming out. I know, but, but it's there. money out of one pocket from, I mean, whatever comes in is going to come out of some other pocket, right? Yeah. So what are they, is it really money, or what are they trying to accomplish, yeah, and will the same thing happen here? I was born and raised in Oregon. More Portland, I literally grew up Portlandia real time, so I get I, I actually grew up the time. So let me tell you, I definitely grew up Portland. Yeah. And my father worked at City Hall, so I definitely know Portland. So I don't have as much history on those counties other than what I read in the news and you know, and I was very young going back to the spotted out days. Um, we already have that issue here. I we don't have it at the extent because you know this more than I do, but Oregon's forestry and their management of those lands is different than how we manage our lands. And I'm not making a judgment call, I'm just saying it's different. I don't know enough to say one is better, right? But in a way it has created this significant conflict that's happening right now of those counties against the state based on the management that the state took and did without including and working with those counties. Um, and it's created a fight mentality, right? And then it played out, if anybody watched the legislature down in Oregon last year, like on the carbon conversation, which is gonna, they're gonna do it again this year. And I don't know if they fixed it, supposedly they have, we'll see. But it played out a massive fight against timber and sort of the environment and carbon when honestly, of all things, of all industries, right, or sectors that should be working, you know, in the well together of environment and natural resources, it's, Timber and forestry and the environment in the context of carbon, right? Just because it's one of our biggest carbon opportunities. And we really, you know, versus like coal or oil, right? You know, um, uh, so 
we are having played out already here in Washington State in a number of ways, but it's very small in the sense of noise and probably also in impact. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, so I'll just tell you a little bit about it and I'll tell you what keeps me up more at night, right? So Clallam County, for example, before I even came into this position, actually had taken a vote to be removed as one of the counties to take their county lands back from our management, my agency's management, as before I was in office. Um, because they didn't feel they were being managed well enough. An analysis has been done, like could they manage it at a lower cost with a greater return, right? Um, the vote failed. But that was certainly tells me, and it should tell Dan, and it who sits on the board and others, that that's a very real issue, and Clallam's not alone in that. Skamania, Wakaika, you know, a lot of those timber sort of towns along the coast that saw their revenue, and I said this, started, it saw it go from 80% in the 1990s to 40% operating now, and they're seeing a continual significant drop and decline, right? Um, and so as that decline continues, to happen, it's gonna get louder and louder. We are currently, have just been sued, and I say we because Dan and I have technically sued as the Board of Natural Resources, we just made a decision on the Marble Marilet. Um, it's a 22 year decision in the making. Um, but it's the Sustainable Harvest Division. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's on the Marvel Muralet and Sustainable Harvest Calculation. So Sustainable Harvest Calculation, every decade we do a Sustainable Harvest Calculation that says, for the next decade, here's how much cut we're going to have of our timber lands. And uh, we, it's broken out by basically those beneficiaries as to what they will get. Um, and we, because it took so long for the, the board, and it's not, I'm gonna say it's not our fault because we are new to the board, uh, but in the 22 years, no board, board wasn't making a decision on the Marvel and Yearlander Sustainable Harvest Calculation. We are already five years into the 10 year Sustainable Harvest Calculation when we finally made a decision about what our cut level. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little crazy, right? You usually make it before you start the decade. Um, and so counties, a few counties have sued us on the sustainable harvest calculation level. They will probably, some of them are piecing the marble mural in because they're connected, but no, there, there's some tenuous um, connection to it. And so that is going to start a more serious conversation, right? Um, that could get to the loudness of Oregon. My goal is to not let it get there by actually leaning into the issue. Um, and this is the work that actually Dr. Brown and I have, um, which is not an easy task, is that if you looked back, and I should have these numbers, but if you look back over you know, 20 plus years, the sustainable harvest calculation was more at that 600 million board feet. Right around, just like, let's even it out there, right? Um, and it is now, uh, we just approved a 465 million board feet. Significant drop. Um, we approved it based on our sustainable harvest calculation of a model, right? It's a model. And a rule, of, there's a couple things that go into play. 2004, I'm going really deep if you guys are getting bored. But in 2004, the board voted on not an even flow policy of our cut. It voted on um, the allowment of a 25 plus or minus, right? We get to inherit the 25 minus, not the 25 plus. Um, and this unfortunate part is, besides that flow policy, besides our inventory change, right? Because you can only trees grow as fast as they wish to grow, right? Not versus. Um, we have a significant rapid decline over the next five decades, which will impact the University of Washington, Wazoo, our K through 12 schools, our counties. And it's my job to go figure out how to fix that. Um, back to the proactive, ideally I would have done it 20 years ago because it's a lot easier to fix it than being right in the midst of it. Um, part of that will be about inventory. It could be about management. Some people are questioning whether our numbers are right that we're putting into the model. Some would say we should harvest more. We're not harvesting our ball, our, um, are, we're not cutting, at, you know, we usually cut right between that 50 to 80 year. We should cut more often. Some argue, no, you should let them grow longer so you get more volume, right? And we've got, I think the biggest piece is gonna be inventory. 
And my ideal dream is if I had a big pot of money, I would be right now, I think, the most significant threat to the state environmentally besides um, climate change, right, is the conversion of forest and agricultural lands, and especially forests. And ideally, we would be positioning our stuff as an agency if I had a big bank, right, and going and buying working forest lands that are converting into our Costco Safeways and subdivisions and leading to um, increased greenhouse gas emissions from cars, but also environmental degradation, so that we can change the inventory we have to even out that flow so that we actually don't have counties or our junior taxing districts and schools angry and upset. It's an exciting job to kind of figure out. I could look forward to you working with me. And maybe we could also work on the exportation of some of our timber so we can create more jobs in those rural communities. I mean, here's, I'll just tell you, I, um, and then I'll, I'll go to your question. So one of the stories that moved me, Sarah, probably the most significant uh, when I took this job is a, uh, a, a person who's now become a dear friend of mine who comes from Merrill Ring, one of the timber companies. Um, and he grew up in Cloudy County, actually grew up in the school with um, Derek uh, Kilmer. And he remembers, and obviously he worked, you know, his father was a leader in Maryland Ring, so he obviously had a lot more resources than many of the kids he went to school with. And he remembers the day the Spotted Owl decision was made, and not because it was the dinner conversation. Um, but because we went to school the next day, he knew exactly who in that classroom's family didn't have jobs. And he then watched year after year the decline of that kid, those kids, middle school, junior high, high school, and on. And that is the challenge. The reality is, is when that decision was made, and now more decisions are being made, and some are being made by us as leaders, but some are being made just by the natural state of the environment, right? It is having consequences. But when those decisions are made, oftentimes, they came down as judgments from a court. They came down from judgments from a leader in Olympi or wherever. And there was no context of, hey, before that decision's made, or as that decision made, what's our transition? for those people. So you think about the coal facility that is um, we have in Washington State. Coal plant shut down, right? Before it shut down, we knew how many jobs were going to be impacted. One in that facility, but then outward. And there was a just transition plan for that. I don't know how well it's worked, but there was at least a plan, right? And that helped for people to know, you heard us, you know the impacts we're going to feel, you know what it means for my kids who don't have food on the table and might not have it, and I can't promise that and you listen and you help work with us to solve that. We got to do more of that. Last question. Yeah, so um, to follow on from that question, um, you talked about, we talked about all the murals, we talked about horror guys, we talked about of salmon. And so, one of the I did mention gooey ducks. Gooey ducks, now they don't, they're, they're not going to have the same common as the others, but they do have a common as the US Species Act. Yes. One of the landmark pieces of legislation, environmental legislation, but also probably, and ironically, the Endangered Species Act is probably endangered. Um, but that said, no one who's been close to it would argue it's a perfect law. So I'd love to hear from your perspective as the land manager what do you think the kind of costs and benefits are in doing your work? So, yeah, I, I worked on the Endangered Species Act as a lawyer, right? Which is really much when you the lawyers in there. Okay. Um, we have a lawsuit. I have right. I'm Queen Khaleesi with my three dragons. And the world's going to change now. Because I got the law on the side and I'm arguing. Um, and that's how I felt coming out of law school practicing the species that law, right? Um, and the reality is I spent 20 plus years on that. This feeling of it all became a complete trade debate about do I have all the science, do I have enough science, is my science actually applicable and great? And it just became a debate and argument. 
And often if we lost really the species, and I mean the human, back to the human side, and the wildlife, or the birds, or the fish. Um, and I think what's interesting about and why I actually stepped out of practicing law, right, and went into policy and government is, I don't think, so I think the Endangered Species Act is a phenomenal law that recognizes the value of species outside of humans, which is what we use as my son, when he was six years old, he's now 21, about to graduate from college, he said to me when he was six, he's like, Mom, why don't you make any money as a lawyer? I don't understand this. Like, everywhere I go on TV, lawyers make a lot of money, and you make nothing. And I said, well, because the trees and the fish have very little money to pay, <laughs> right? And the reality is the Endangered Species Act is brilliant at being able to see that humans are not the only species on the planet and should not be the only and ideally also made a true connection between the importance of those species for our own survival, which clearly still gets lost. I think the hard part that is missed, and back to that kind of context we talked about, how Golden Bird Community said, is that it's lost that social context of how we bring communities along that are most impacted by it and feel like it's been done to them, being versus being them being part of it. Right? So an example of that is, um, you know, I go into Eastern Washington and I go into the rural areas all the time. And now I'm going to say, I wish there was never a salmon ever in Washington. Like, kill them all. Let's get rid of them. Ship them somewhere else. They don't want, they love salmon. I eat fish, right? Right? They want those species there. What they feel is that they're always the one paying the price of saving those fish, right? And a perfect example is they look at Seattle and go, I mean, and, and timber and forestry do this all the time. You're like, you just put this big buffer on my, you know, small person, you put this big buffer on my land. And I went to Seattle and I'm like, what's that creek? There's no buffer at all. But you won't want me to do it, right? And you don't pay a single price for it. And you know, they're right in some ways, right? They're right in some ways. Um, I get the same thing in fire. Why, why am I in Seattle paying for fire? Wildfire protection in eastern Washington, or the, right? Why should I pay for that, right? I'm not impacted. Well, you know, when the smoke hit, but that's it in their mind, right? And we have to somehow, we all know we've lost that sense of the, what I should know is it just uh, the comments, right? The sense of, right, that we all are one community. And my children and my, my children's future is important to you, right? as your children's future is to mine, or the person in Iowa, or the person in Okanagan's children. And we're now seeing it in the context of mental health and addiction and homelessness, right? right? And how much we're paying for that. We're now seeing the price of the fact that we didn't take everybody's children, everybody's family, as a value of ours, even if they live far, far away, and they might disagree with the salmon protection policy. And that's what we have to do is figure out you know, and, and I see this, I, I was in Okanagan this summer, and, you know, they're talking about the wolves, right, which is one of our biggest battles in endangered species right now. And for them, they're like, do you notice how there's no more hunters really? Like they used to, they said, oh, the hunting shop used to be packed on Saturdays. I mean, we couldn't even get in the door, and out of only 10 people were talking in the coffee shop, right? It's like, it's the wolves. Ooh, we did this. We don't hunger have elk. I can't hunt. And I go, wait. They were the natural resource people. They love being in the environment, and now they can't even enjoy it because, right? And we got to change that dialogue, and it's not easy. And the only way we're going to do it is by showing up and starting to try to solve these problems almost at this community local level, and one that recognizes the economic, social, and environmental sort of ecosystem of it, and the ecosystem of us, whether we're urban or rural, Democrat, Republic. Not easy. Great summary. You make it sound easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for spending the day with us. Oh my gosh, it's an honor. It's Thank you guys. Wonderful. Thank you.